Revolution and Counter-Revolution, or Germany in 1848, by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Chapter 4. Austria We have now to consider Austria, that country which, up to March 1848, was sealed up to the eyes of foreign nations almost as much as China before the late war with England. As a matter of course, we can here take into consideration nothing but German Austria. The affairs of the Polish, Hungarian, or Italian Austrians do not belong to our subject, and as far as they, since 1848, have influenced the fate of the German Austrians, they will have to be taken into account later. The government of Prince Metternich turned upon two hinges. Firstly, to keep every one of the different nations subjected to the Austrian rule in check by all other nations similarly conditioned. Secondly, and this has always been the fundamental principle of absolute monarchies, to rely for support upon two classes, the feudal landlords and the large stock-jobbing capitalists, and to balance, at the same time, the influence and power of either of these classes by that of the other, so as to leave full independence of action to the government. The landed nobility, whose entire income consisted in feudal revenues of all sorts, could not but support a government which proved their only protection against that downtrodden class of serfs upon whose spoils they lived. And whenever the last wealthy portion of them, as in Galicia, in 1846, rose in opposition against the government, Metternich in an instant let loose upon them these very serfs, who at any rate profited by the occasion to wreak a terrible vengeance upon their more immediate oppressors. On the other hand, the large capitalists of the exchange were chained to Metternich's government by the vast share that they had in the public funds of the country. Austria, restored to her full power in 1815, restoring and maintaining in Italy absolute monarchy ever since 1820, freed from part of her liabilities by the bankruptcy of 1810, had, after the peace, very soon re-established her credit in the great European money markets, and in proportion as her credit grew, she had drawn against it. Thus, all the large European money dealers had engaged considerable portions of their capital in the Austrian funds, they all of them were interested in upholding the credit of that country, and as Austrian public credit, in order to be upheld, ever required new loans, they were obliged, from time to time, to advance new capital in order to keep up the credit of the securities for that which they already had advanced. The long peace after 1815, and the apparent impossibility of a thousand years old empire, like Austria, being upset, increased the credit of Metternich's government in a wonderful ratio and made it even independent of the goodwill of the Vienna bankers and stock jobbers. For as long as Metternich could obtain plenty of money at Frankfurt and Amsterdam, he had, of course, the satisfaction of seeing the Austrian capitalists at his feet. They were, besides, in every other respect at his mercy. The large profits which bankers, stock jobbers, and government contractors always contrived to draw out of an absolute monarchy were compensated for by the almost unlimited power which the government possessed over their persons and fortunes. And not the smallest shadow of an opposition was, therefore, to be expected from this quarter. Thus Metternich was sure of the support of the two most powerful and influential classes of the empire, and he possessed besides an army and a bureaucracy which for all purposes of absolutism could not be better constituted. The civil and military officers in the Austrian service form a race of their own. Their fathers have been in service of the Kaiser, and so will their sons be. They belong to none of the multifarious nationalities congregated under the wing of the double-headed eagle. They are, and ever have been, removed from one end of the empire to the other, from Poland to Italy, from Germany to Transylvania, Hungarian, Pole, German, Romanian, Italian, Croat, every individual not stamped with imperial and royal authority, etc., bearing a separate national character, is equally despised by them. They have no nationality, 
or rather, they alone make up the really Austrian nation. It is evident what a pliable and at the same time powerful instrument in the hands of an intelligent and energetic chief such a civil and military hierarchy must be. As to the other classes of the population, Metternich, in the true spirit of a statesman of the ancient regime, cared little for their support. He had, with regard to them, but one policy, to draw out as much as possible out of them in the shape of taxation, and at the same time, to keep them quiet. The trading and manufacturing middle class was but of slow growth in Austria. The trade of the Danube was comparatively unimportant. The country possessed but one port, Trieste, and the trade of the port was very limited. As to the manufacturers, they enjoyed considerable protection, amounting even in the most cases to the complete exclusion of all foreign competition. But this advantage had been granted to them principally with a view to increase their tax-paying capabilities and was in a high degree counterpoised by internal restrictions on manufacturers, privileges on guilds, and other feudal corporations, which were scrupulously upheld as long as they did not impede the purposes and views of the government. The petty tradesmen were encased in the narrow bounds of these medieval guilds, which kept the different trades in a perpetual war of privilege against each other, and at the same time, by all but excluding individuals of the working class from the possibility of raising themselves in the social scale, give a sort of hereditary stability to the members of these involuntary associations. Lastly, the peasant and the working man were treated as mere taxable matter, and the only care that was taken of them was to keep them as much as possible in the same conditions of life in which they then existed and in which their fathers had existed before them. For this purpose, every old, established, hereditary authority was upheld in the same manner as that of the state, the authority of the landlord over the petty tenant farmer, that of the manufacturer over the operative, of the small master over the journeyman and apprentice, of the father over the son, was everywhere rigidly maintained by the government, and every branch of disobedience punished the same as a transgression of the law by that universal instrument of Austrian justice, the stick. Finally, to wind up into one comprehensive system all these attempts at creating an artificial stability, the intellectual food allowed to the nation was selected with the minutest caution and dealt out as sparingly as possible. Education was everywhere in the hands of the Catholic priesthood, whose chiefs, in the same manner as the large feudal landowners, were deeply interested in the conservation of the existing system. The universities were organized in a manner which allowed them to produce nothing but special men that might or might not obtain great proficiency in sundry particular branches of knowledge, but which, at all events, excluded that universal liberal education which other universities were expected to impart. There was absolutely no newspaper press, except in Hungary, and the Hungarian papers were prohibited in all other parts of the monarchy. As to general literature, its range had not widened for a century. It had narrowed again after the death of Joseph II. And all around the frontier, wherever the Austrian states touched upon a civilized country, a cordon of literary censors was established in connection with a cordon of custom house officials preventing any foreign book or newspaper from passing into Austria before its contents had been twice or three times thoroughly sifted and found pure of even the slightest contamination of the malignant spirit of the age. For about thirty years after 1815, this system worked with wonderful success. Austria remained almost unknown to Europe, and Europe was quite as little known in Austria. The social state of every class of the population and of the population as a whole, appeared not to have undergone the slightest change. Whatever rancor there might exist from class to class, and the existence of this rancor was for Metternich a principal condition of government, which he even fostered by making the higher classes the instruments of all government exactions, and thus throwing the odium upon them. Whatever hatred the people might bear for the inferior officials of the state, there existed upon the whole little or no dissatisfaction with the central government. 
the emperor was adored, and old Francis I seemed to be borne out by the facts when, doubting of the durability of this system, he complacently added, and yet it will hold while I live, and Metternich. But there was a slow underground movement going on which baffled all Metternich's efforts. The wealth and influence of the manufacturing and trading middle class increased. The introduction of machinery and steam power in manufactures upset in Austria, as it had done everywhere else, the old relations and vital conditions of whole classes of society. It changed serfs into free men, small farmers into manufacturing operatives. It undermined the old feudal trades corporations and destroyed the means of existence of many of them. The new commercial and manufacturing population came everywhere into collision with old feudal institutions. The middle classes, more and more induced by their business to travel abroad, introduced some mythical knowledge of the civilized countries situated beyond the imperial line of customs. The introduction of railways finally accelerated both the industrial and intellectual movement. There was, too, a dangerous part in the Austrian state establishment. This? The Hungarian feudal constitution, with its parliamentary proceedings and its struggles of the impoverished and oppositional mass of the nobility against the government and its allies, the magnates. Pressburg, the seat of the Diet, was at the very gates of Vienna. All the elements contributed to create among the middle classes of the towns a spirit, not exactly of opposition, for opposition was as yet impossible, but of discontent a general wish for reforms, more of an administrative than of a constitutional nature. And in the same manner as in Prussia, a portion of the bureaucracy joined the bourgeoisie. Among this hereditary caste of officials, the traditions of Joseph II were not forgotten. The more educated functionaries of the government, who themselves sometimes meddled with imaginary possible reforms, by far preferred the progressive and intellectual despotism of that emperor to the paternal despotism of Metternich. A portion of the poorer nobility equally sided with the middle class, and as to the lower classes of the population, who always had found plenty of grounds to complain of their superiors, if not of the government, they in most cases could not but adhere to the reformatory wishes of the bourgeoisie. It was about this time, say, 1843 or 1844, that a particular branch of literature, agreeable to this change, was established in Germany. A few Austrian writers, novelists, literary critics, bad poets, the whole of them of very indifferent ability, but gifted with that peculiar industrialism proper to the Jewish race, established themselves in Leipzig and other German towns out of Austria, and there, out of the reach of Metternich, published a number of books and pamphlets on Austrian affairs. They and their publishers made a roaring trade of it. All Germany was eager to become initiated into the secrets of the policy of European China, and the Austrians themselves, who obtained these publications by wholesale smuggling on the Bohemian frontier, were still more curious. Of course, the secrets let out in these publications were of no great importance and the reform plan schemed out by their well-wishing authors bore the stamp of an innocuousness almost amounting to political virginity. A constitution and the free press for Austria were things considered unattainable. Administrative reforms, extension of the rights of the provincial diets, admission of foreign books and newspapers, and the less severe censorship, the loyal and humble desires of these good Austrians did hardly go any further. At all events, the growing impossibility of preventing the literary intercourse of Austria with the rest of Germany, and through Germany with the rest of the world, contributed much towards the formation of an anti-governmental public opinion, and brought at least some little political information within the reach of part of the Austrian population. Thus, by the end of 1847, Austria was seized, although in an inferior degree, by that political and political-religious agitation which then prevailed in all Germany. And if its progress in Austria was more silent, it did, nevertheless, find revolutionary elements enough to work upon. There was the peasant, serf, or feudal tenant, 
ground down into the dust by lordly or government exactions. Then the factory operative, forced by the stick of the policeman to work upon any terms the manufacturer chose to grant. Then the journeyman, debarred by the corporative laws from any chance of gaining an independence in his trade. Then the merchant, stumbling at every step in business over absurd regulations. Then the manufacturer, an uninterrupted conflict with trade guilds, jealous of their privileges, or with greedy and meddling officials. Then the schoolmaster, the savant, the better educated functionary, vainly struggling against an ignorant and presumptuous clergy, or a stupid and dictating superior. In short, there was not a single class satisfied, for the small concessions government was obliged now and then to make were not made at its own expense, for the treasury could not afford that, but at the expense of the high aristocracy and clergy. And as to the great bankers and fund holders, the late events in Italy, the increasing opposition of the Hungarian diet, and the unwanted spirit of discontent and cry for reform manifested themselves all over the empire, were not of a nature to strengthen their faith in the solidity and solvency of the Austrian Empire. Thus Austria, too, was marching slowly but surely toward a mighty change when, of a sudden, an event broke out in France, which at once brought down the impending storm and gave the lie to old Francis's assertion that the building would hold out both during his and Metternich's lifetime. London, September, 1851